Good evening and welcome once again to another program of Issues in the News, where we discuss the important events that would have taken place in our country over the past week or so. And I want to begin by welcoming all of you who are joining us on television in West Coast Barbies, Mahaika, all the way to Rusignol, Blairmont, and beyond Ithaca. Good evening and welcome to another program of Issues in the News. Across the Barbies River, all of you who are joining us on television on the east bank of the Barbies River, all the way to Kanji, and of course right along the quarantine coast, all the way to Molson Creek. Good evening, and I cannot forget the people at I Shelton who says to me, who say to me that they are seeing this program as well on television. Good evening and welcome to another program of Issues in the News. To our followers and listeners and viewers who are joining us from Freedom Radio, Rob Street, Georgetown, good evening and welcome to another program of Issues in the News. And last but not least, to the tens of thousands of you who are joining us on Facebook Live from across Guyana, the Caribbean, North America, Europe, Asia, and as far as Australia and New Zealand. Good evening and welcome to another program of Issues in the News. It's good to be here, and as I would normally invite you to do, I do so now, please, Share this program, press that share button on your computer, on your phone, so that your friends and your followers can join in this program, can join us in our discussions this evening, and we can have the widest possible audience. I see so many of you have joined us today already, tonight, Charles Gill, Bansi Pasad, Maureen Ramcharan, Barry Sanchara, Darshanan Gobin, Gandhi Unarain, Louis Ponwasi from New York, Mark Wilson, a regular, Mike Kelawan, uh, Daisy Peter Petal Jawahir, and so many of you. Good evening and welcome to another program of Issues in the News. And I must begin by extending to you my sincere best wishes for a prosperous and happy 2023. Happy New Year to you and all your family, friends, and loved ones. And I want to thank you very much for the support that you have given to me and given to this program over the last few years. This program is entering its eighth year now. Eighth year now this program is on the air. So we are celebrating this year our eighth anniversary. And most of you have been with me on this program from its inception. The names, I can see them. I know all these names now by heart. I feel as though I know most of you personally, although I don't think I can recognize you, but the names have become so familiar. After seeing them every week and speaking to you and engaging you, I feel as though I know each and every one of you. And I want to thank you very much for being part of this family of issues in the news for the past eight years. We have another long year ahead of us, a year that I predict will bring great things for Guyana, for us, and most importantly, for the people of Guyana, for you and your family. So I hope that we stick together again and enjoy another year of exchange of views and engagements. I take it also that you have had a quiet, restful, peaceful, and enjoyable holidays. We have come to the end of that holiday season, 
and now we have to put our shoulders to the wheel, to the wheel, sorry, as we resume the task of nation building. So I see many of you are here. I want you to share the program again. I'm appealing to you, Chetram Lal, Elma Sri Kushan, Andy Kisun. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for all the New Year greetings I'm getting. Vinod Chander Paul, Janet Singh, and so many of you. So thank you very much for all the best wishes that you are extending to me, and I reciprocate. And please, let's continue to work together. This year, continue to engage each other. This year, as we thrive, as we strive to put our best foot forward in advancing the developmental agenda of our country. So there are a couple of important things that I want to speak about tonight as it relates to the year 2023. The year has just begun, so it's not a heavy program, but still yet there are some very important events that are scheduled to take place and I want to touch and highlight on some of those events. One of the most significant constitutional event, events to take place in this country this year is our local government elections. As you are aware, local government elections are due in Guyana. The government has indicated its preparedness and readiness to participate in those elections. Funds have been allocated for those elections to be held. The Minister of Local Government, who has the statutory authority to appoint the date for those elections, has done so, and therefore the government has discharged its responsibility Elections in Guyana are administered by an independent constitutional body called GCOM, the Guyana Elections Commission. Once the minister has indicated his readiness and elections are due, the GCOM must do that which is necessary to hold those elections. Unfortunately, based upon the way events are unfolding at that agency, we have had constant delays. Though the minister has appointed a day for elections to be held, from all indications, it appears that GCOM will not be in a position to hold those elections. That is highly regrettable, that is highly unfortunate. It is the constitutional duty of GCOM to hold elections when elections fall due. That is all that GCOM is required to do. The time for elections is upon us and I am repeating again, GCOM needs to do all that is necessary to ready the machinery to hold these elections. Elections are an important part of the democratic fabric of our society. It is part of the constitutional machinery of our democracy. And I want, we have had in Guyana a sordid past when it comes to elections. We have had a history of rigged elections under the PNC at the national level. At the local level, we have not had elections when elections are due or were due. It would be recalled that after the 1992 elections, 
Elections became due in 1994 and those elections were held. After that, we had disturbances after the 97 elections, which prevented the next round of local government elections from being held. We then went into constitutional reform between 97 to 90, 2001, 2000. All the parties agreed that we must complete those reforms and then we must go to national elections and then we will go back to local government elections. PNC and PPP and the other political parties agreed to that. We completed the constitutional reforms. We went to the 2001 elections. Of course, there was violence, but put that aside after those elections. A task force was established by the PNC and the PPP to sort out what the contentious and controversial matters were so that local government elections were to be held. That task force never completed its work. As I said, it was a joint task force. To facilitate the task force completing its work, every year an amendment had to have been made to the law for the postponement of local government elections. That amendment was done every year with the support of the PNC that was in the opposition. Every year you had this postponement of the elections and the postponement was done consensually in the parliament. That went on year after year after year until, in fact, there was one year where the elections could have been held, the local government elections could have been held, I believe, it was around 2006. And Mr. Robert Corbyn, who was then the opposition leader, had written to President Bharat Jagdev requesting that the local government elections be postponed again and for us to go to national elections. And that's how we went to national elections in 2006. After that, again, both sides went to the parliament every year to postpone the local government elections because the joint work that the two parties have agreed to do and complete before those elections were held were not being completed. That went on until 2011. And when in 2011, the opposition, APNU, AFC, won a one-seat majority, they completely started, they started a completely new narrative that it was the PPP who was to be blamed for not holding the local government elections. Knowing full well that there was almost over one and a half decade of agreement to postpone these elections. And this postponement was being done jointly by the two parties. Suddenly after 2011, a new political narrative emerged that blamed the PPP for not holding local government elections since 1994. And that narrative continued until 2015 when they won the government and they went into the government and they held elections in 2016. The truth of the matter is that from 1997-98 until 2011, both parties had agreed that certain works were to be done before election, local government elections were held. And that lasted until 2011, as I just said. So there was no PPP was not to be blamed alone, but this is how these people operate. They join with you and then remove themselves and blame you. They 
the same thing that they did with use of an ID card for the 90, 1997 elections. Join with the PPP, passed a law in the parliament that you cannot vote without a voter's ID card. When they lost the elections, they challenged the elections on the ground that it was illegal to use a voter's ID card when they voted in parliament in support of that position. I thought that I will spend some time tonight to deal with the history of local government elections so that you understand how the non-holding of these elections occurred and who were responsible. It was not a one-party thing. It, they were joint applications made to adjourn these elections in the parliament. And the record of the parliament will support what I'm saying. So we need to correct that narrative. So now we are ready to hold those elections. They are due. But every meeting at GCOM, APNU, AFC, has been using stalling and delaying tactics in causing the elections date not to be met. And currently, it is highly unlikely that we will have the elections on the date fixed by the minister. Now, I want to make it absolutely clear that the blame for this cannot be put at the government's feet. As we have budgeted the money and we have done everything possible including fixing the date for the elections. It is the opposition, members of the commission, who have been raising one objection after another to delay these elections. We have been compromising, not conceding, we have been compromising on every occasion that they have raised these objections. And every time we compromise, they shift the goalpost and they raise another objection. I hope that the international community is observing what is transpiring at GCOM. And I hope that it is seen very clearly that government is ready, willing, and anxious to hold local government or to participate in local government elections and any delay must not be placed at the foot of the government and I'm using this program once again to say that elections are due and to call upon GCOM to do all that is necessary to ensure that these elections are held early in, the twen in this 2023. So I wanted to deal with elections, local government elections, and get the history out of the way so that people understand how the delay occurred for the non-holding of elections and who was responsible. Another important event that is scheduled to take place this year, at least to commence this year, is constitutional reform. I've spoken about this at length, so I'll not dwell on it for much too long, except to say that all the political parties that participated in the 2020 general and regional elections promised constitutional reform. We have already enacted the Constitutional Reform Commission Act and that act provides for how constitutional reform will be done. It provides for the appointment of a constitutional reform commission. It states how the commission is to be comprised 
and it says how the commission should perform its statutory functions. Early this year, that commission will be appointed and will begin its work. This is a broad-based commission made up of 50% politicians and 50% civil society organizations representing the various important sectoral interests in our country. Side by side with constitutional reform, we will also have law revision taking place. Now, what is law revision? Law revision is essentially where you update the laws of your country. And you do that by inserting the various amendments that would have been made over a period into principal acts or principal laws that they have amended. So if you amend the Representation of the People's Act, then the amendments now, you have to insert them where they are going to be in the Principal Act, the, the Representation of the People's Act, so that the amendments and the Principal Act merges into one. And if you have new laws or new acts of parliament, you also bring them together and you consolidate all. So you have bodies of laws, sorry, volumes of, of, of the law, starting from chapter one to wherever it ends. So you have one set of laws. You don't have to go and look for different pieces scattered all over. That is very important in a functioning democracy. If you want the rule of law to prevail in any society, then people must have access to the law. How else will they know the law? They must be able to find it and have access to it. And it must be in an orderly fashion so that the ordinary man can pick up the law and read it and don't have to go and look here for an amendment and there for an amendment. He can go and he can buy all the laws. We're going to have hard copies and soft copies. Now, in 1977, 1977, we did a consolidation exercise, a law revision exercise, sorry, a law revision exercise in 1977. We did another one in 2012. So we had a hiatus of nearly 35 years. So in that period, you could imagine how much work had to have been done to get the law revision exercise concluded in 2012. We are doing one now that will update and revise our laws up to December 31st, 2022. December 31st last year. And that we will finish it by the first quarter of 2023. And significantly, this is a very, this is 12, 10 years of law from 2012 to 2022, December 31st. So it's a huge exercise. And we are going to finish it by the first quarter of 2023. Work has been ongoing on it since 2020, since we were elected. So we have a, most of the work already completed. All we are finishing off now is the year 2022. And after that, we go to print. And then, so we have hard copies, and of course, we will have soft copies. Now this is a mammoth undertaking, and it's a lot of money, but fortunately, we got funding from various sources, and we were able to accomplish this exercise with least cost to the taxpayer. I'll speak more about that 
later in terms of the funding, etc. So that is another major event tied to constitutional reform, the law revision exercise, which will be completed very shortly or early in the year 2023. Um, this year also, very early in the year, the Judicial Service Commission and the Public Service Commission shall be appointed. All the preparatory work has been done and these important commissions will be appointed so that important appointments can be made to the public sector or in the public sector and in the magistracy and judiciary. We, are, or we have already laid a bill in the parliament which seeks to increase the complement of court of appeal judges to nine. So all these are complementing each other. And hopefully this year, hopefully this year, the process will begin for the appointment of a chancellor and a chief justice. This matter is long overdue and hopefully this year we are able to get an agreement between the president and the leader of the opposition as is required by the constitution for appointments to be made to these two important offices substantively. This year also we will commence work on the establishment of a regional law school in Guyana. It will be recalled that a few months ago, the Council of Legal Education gave Guyana the green light for the establishment of a law school, a regional law school, within territorial Guyana. Work will begin earnestly towards the establishment of that school during the year 2023. So what is happening on the political front? Before I deal with that, let me get some of your views. Let me see if you are providing me with any advice or any guidance in terms of what you want me to speak about. As I told you, tonight is going to be um, a light program, so, but I'm not seeing, you're not telling me um, here they're saying this, this, this comment Pam Singh is telling us that people are becoming more aware of the laws, and that's a good thing, but police are bullying citizens and demanding money from them. Well, I have always said that it takes two persons for a bribe to be successful. You have to have a briber and you have to have a bribee. If there is no briber, then there will be no bribery. So citizens have to understand that they cannot bribe policemen. Make it public if a policeman asks you for a bribe. Whole day I, I see people doing live on Facebook. and Use your Facebook and your social platform social media platform to highlight instances of this nature. I have said in the public sector, in the legal sector, when bribe is requested of you, make it public. Take a photograph or go live and say, this is man is asking me for a bribe. That's the, one of the ways by which we can deal with the issue. 
but there are too many people, too many persons, and persons don't like to hear this. There are too many persons who are prepared and very willing to pay the bribe. In fact, there are many people who offer the bribe, but people don't like to hear this. That because you know it's difficult for persons to accept their fault. They go to criticize me for even saying this. If it is that you have violated the law, then let the policeman charge you. If you believe that you're innocent, you go to court and the case is tried. But it's when you want to compromise the legal process, it is when you want to pervert the legal process, then, it, then is when the issue of bribery arises. And too many times, unfortunately, there are too many people who are prepared to compromise due process. I am not saying that the police do not abuse their powers. I'm not saying so at all. Every day I deal with that, and I am working every day. We are working every day to ensure that abuse of power at every level in the state apparatus is minimized. I don't think one can ever eliminate it, but we are working feverishly every day to minimize executive lawlessness, arrogance in public office, and abuse of power. Every day we are working to address these ills in the public sector. So don't think for one moment that we are not cognizant of it. But when persons, the ordinary citizens, and important members of our, of our society, they partake in it and participate in it, it makes our task a little more difficult. So I hope those observations are being Listen to so that we can have we can have less of these occurrence in the year twenty twenty three. So the opposition in the year twenty twenty three, I see they have done vast and wide ranging pronouncements on expected government's performance in 2023, of course of a condemnatory nature, and one does not expect better from the opposition. But some very interesting disclosures are being made in respect of the opposition. You know, every time the opposition leader speaks. And every time members and leaders of the opposition political parties speak, there are a couple of terminologies that is always omnipresent in their conversation and in their public disclosures. There are some accusatory remarks that are invariably saturating whatever they want to say. If they're speaking about the flooding in Guyana, if they're speaking about any given issue, any given issue, you will find an allegation made about corruption. No matter what it is that they're talking about. You will hear ethnic, racial, and political discrimination. You will hear 
about accountability or its lack thereof. You will hear about lack of transparency. You will hear about, let's deal with those. Those are adjectives that are used to describe the government and governmental conduct at every level of society by the opposition. It is the aspirations cast on almost every member of our government. All of us. We are corrupt and we are unaccountable and we are racist and we are discriminatory and we are incompetent and so on. And the person who leads from the front is Mr. Aubrey Norton himself. I can't imagine, I can't, I, I don't think I've ever heard him speak as opposition leader and even before that. And those accusations are not part of his narrative. Whatever is the topic he's referring to. And in the newspapers today, there is a big screaming headline where the treasurer, the former treasurer of the PNC, Faiz Mursalim, Faiz, F E A I Z, Mursalim, is accusing Aubrey Norton of racial discrimination and corruption. This is the treasurer of his political party accusing him of racial discrimination and corruption. As I said, this is a guy, Aubrey Norton, and his entire political party who can't speak on any matter without accusing government of corruption and racial discrimination. And here it is, the treasurer of his own party making those identical allegations against him. The man said that because of this type of conduct, he has resigned his position. This is a man who has been with the party for over a decade. So this is not a fly-by-night person. And they saw it fit to make him the treasurer of the party. Mursalin says that he faced racial discrimination during his time as a treasurer. And then he says this, firstly, from the time I took office as the elected treasurer of this great party, I was signing blank checks with no supporting documents. I'm always called to sign checks and whenever I share an opinion of dislike towards this, I am met with hostility. In the month of November, it got worse. I'm reading from the article. I was told by the confidential secretary to the general secretary that all I'm needed for is to sign the checks. And in that month, I signed about 20 blank checks. I do not know what are the amounts of money written on any of those checks. I don't know for what reason the money, if they were spent, Morsellin said in his letter. Morsellin says that he detailed his actions. And he drew them to Aubrey Norton's attention. No action was taken. He was met with racial hostility because he raised the complaint. He 
He says that Norton is like a one-man show. All of that is in the article. And it is a whole another page. And this is a political party, and this is a man who is accusing government and everybody else of corruption and of racism. And here it is that his own treasurer, his own treasurer is making the identical allegations against him. A few months ago, Gita Chandan Edmund, another senior functionary of this party, made similar obligations, similar objections, similar complaints. And I believe she tendered her resignation as well. And then you will recall that just a few months prior, Annette Ferguson wrote a letter to Norton calling for an investigation of certain elections held in certain organs within the PNC. Allegations of electoral fraud within the PNC. Norton himself Aubrey Norton himself is on public record making allegations of fraud in respect of internal elections within the PNC. And now he himself is being accused as leader and a complaint is lodged with him to investigate electoral fraud within the PNC. And he is accusing the government of authoritarianism. He is accusing the government of being high-handed and being undemocratic. And here it is that his treasurer of his party is accusing him of running the party as a one-man show. And this treasurer, trust me, is not in the minority. Many senior functionaries of the PNC have quietly gone their way. Have quietly gone their way. Some of them are still around, but they have their own personal problems. They have the same type of complaints. Because, and they speak to people about it. They speak to people about it. I say that simply to demonstrate the duplicity and the hypocrisy of these people, from Norton right down to the bottom of the current leadership and those who are in the parliament, who like to stand up and speak with moral authority and speak as though they are so chaste and that they are the, 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 the epitome of virtue. And this is what, this is how they behave in their own party and organization. And this is exactly how they behaved in government. This is exactly how they behaved in government. This incest and this internal thing and this unaccountability. And that's why they were able to form a company in the office of the president comprising of persons in the office of the president and spent how many billion dollars on Durban Park? You remember that? These people mentally, they, they can't 
it's it's the perhaps it's a remnants, it's remnants of party paramongsi, I'm not sure. They can't see a difference between the party and the state. So when they were in the government, they formed a government company in the office of the president and was doing the Urban Park. That is why they felt that they could have given a man named Larry Singh a rental contract for $12.5 million a month to rent a house in our boys town. The man did not even own the house. They gave him three months rent in advance. The man used that three months rent in advance and purchased the house. Imagine they rented a house to the man. The man didn't own it. The man did not own the house at the time. The man used three months rent in advance that they gave and buy the house. That one transaction cost the taxpayers 400 million US, 400 million Ghana dollars, 2 million US dollars. That one single transaction. Never went to tender. Never went to the tender board. You can remember the minister walking into the public hospital and instructed the CEO of the hospital to buy drugs, five point something billion dollars in drugs from a particular company, five point something billion dollars in drugs. Just, she just directed the man to go and buy the drugs. Absolutely no procurement, none, no public tendering. And as it turned out, you could have gotten that drugs that they bought for half the price. And I, I don't want to go into all the sale of properties, that it, how they, the way they were selling state properties without any valuation, passing title when they were not even authorized to pass title at the Lands and Surveys Commission. This, what you are seeing here, happening in the PNC again, is simply a manifestation of what they did in government and, and, and how they how they operate how they operate within their own party. Carl Greenwich has made allegations that they have rigged elections in Congress place. Norton has made allegations that they have rigged elections in Congress place. Now, Annette Ferguson is making allegations that they have rigged elections. If they are rigging their own elections, what do you think they will do nationally, as we all saw, as they attempted to do with Mingo and with Lowenfield in March 2020 and beyond? So, the point I am making is that come 2023, you will see much more of this. You will see a degenerate and a degenerated opposition. If any person within the PPP had made these types of allegations, against the PPP or against a leader within the PPP. Oh my, oh my. You would have Duncan, they would have been all over the social media. The whole, the fringe element, lunatic segment in New York would have gone rabid as usual. The social media would not have had space for anything else. Let us speak about what this man is saying. 
Faiz Morselin. Let them discuss this. Let them put this in the ring. Let them put this in the ring and ring the bell and talk about this. Let the fight start. Let the mad one in, Luna, in Brooklyn talk about this. Let him get the American people to talk about this. They want this to die away. They don't want us to talk about this. They don't want anybody to talk about this. But this here is what they are accusing others of. I always say, it's the racist who will always make the allegations of racism. A non-racist person don't think racism. They don't think about race. It is the racist who will always ring the racial bell. And here it is. The gentleman is accusing them exactly of that. And Chandan, the same thing. Amna Ali is no longer there. These are not coincidences. These are not coincidences. I see Mahipal writing letter to say how great Aubrey Norton is. A poor Mahipal, he must be the last one left. He has to be scrambling and clamoring for survival. So my friend, we don't have much to expect from the opposition, much positives. We will have the regular incompetence, we will have the misbehavior in the parliament, we will have the non-constructive input, you wouldn't have any constructive engagement, and this is the year where you need important decisions to be made. You need important consultations to take place. We have constitutional reform. Imagine they want constitutional reform. They did, they promised in 2011. They never delivered. They promised in 2015. They never delivered. We have now established, we are moving to establish the commission. They did not even attend the parliament to debate the constitutional reform bill. They did not even attend the parliament to participate in the debate of the bill. So while I am an optimist, and I would hope that what I'm saying is not right, and is not correct, and will not be borne out, and that we have a responsible opposition, and that they will defy what I'm saying. And that they will come and work with the government constructively, critically, but constructively, on important matters. I hope that I'm wrong and they will do that. But I doubt it. I doubt it very much based upon, you, you know, you can't get blood out of stone. It's as simple as that. And once you have this bunch, I don't know how they key, how you will get anything good out of them. And unfortunately, that is what we have to deal with as a government. Every day you have to, while you're trying to push forward, you have to, you have to re remember that you have another force pulling you back. But we have to go forward with our national developmental programs. The budget will be presented shortly and we will have that discourse that will begin. And you will see their behavior again. And you will hear the content of their speeches. You will see that they will not come with any constructive proposals. We have to build and do things in a sustainable way. They want instant gratification. So they want a lot of money and they want, you know, we have to do things in a sustained way. We have to lay the foundation so that money can be earned, not spent. And you, anybody 
in your business, you know that you have to invest in that business before you get rewards. They want the rewards up front. They don't want to do the investment. They don't want to do the hard work. They want the rewards only. Rewards never come that way. Life is not structured that way. So my friends, as I said tonight, is a light program. I don't have a big agenda. And I just wanted to be with you, to start the year with you, and to tell you that we have an entire year of engagement. And I hope you will join me again next week. I'm sure the tempo will pick up next week as we continue to converse and to engage on matters of national importance taking place in Guyana. And also we will discuss issues that are outside of Guyana but relevant to Guyana. I want to thank you very much for being with me over the past hour or so. And I want again to reiterate all my best wishes to you for a prosperous, healthy, happy, successful, and accomplishing 2023. We have many, many more programs. Let's stay together. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Stay safe. May God bless you. And I'll see you again next Tuesday as we heat up the temple. Thank you very much and take care.